Don't crack it. You don't need to watch this review of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. It's just, like, not really necessary, is it? If you're disappointed with the games and the general direction the Pokemon series has been going, like I am, then nothing in this review will surprise you. I do suppose that sometimes it's cathartic to listen to someone being critical of something that you yourself are critical of. If that's the case, then I suppose I can't blame you for sticking around. But if that's not you, if you find yourself annoyed by my constant Pokemon-related complaints, then I also assure you that nothing here will come as a surprise. Frankly, I don't even know why you clicked this video. You know what you're getting yourself into with these. If you do not heed my warning and click away now, then I cannot be held responsible for any annoyance that you may feel in the coming half hour or so. This is Arlo reviewing a Pokemon game. You have been warned. Before we begin, please keep in mind that this is a very, very subjective and straightforward review. Many people will review a remake only as a remake and focus mainly on improvements and changes. Many others have reviewed these games with more experience and can tell you all the stuff that's bad now, but it was good in Platinum. Me? I don't know how much of these games are perfectly faithful. I don't know how much of them would have been different if they'd just been Platinum instead. I'm just looking at them as games. I'll talk about how they're remakes, sure, but just remember that I'm giving you my feelings on my experiences. Whether those experiences reflect Diamond and Pearl as they always were, or reflect only these remakes. Another note, it's really annoying to have to constantly refer to a set of Pokemon games as plural when they're really just one game with the slightest differences. So I'm just gonna refer to them as one game from now on. Well, even if it has no real cultural value and contributes nothing good to society, instead only contributing to an ever-growing sense of snobbish entitlement in the realm of electronic toys that were never meant to be played by myself nor most of the people watching this, here's my review of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. First things first, my history with this game. I played the original on the DS and I didn't really enjoy it. This was strange because as a kid, I was obsessed with Pokemon and just a few years prior had really enjoyed Ruby and Sapphire. I had loved every Pokemon game I'd ever played up to that point, but something about this one just didn't gel with me. It felt very rote. It had all the elements that make up a Pokemon game, but somehow it felt like the heart was missing. The charm, that little bit of personality to make the experience stick in my mind. Generations 2 and 3 had added so much to the series, both visually and mechanically, while each having their own unique identities. But Gen 4 just felt like Gen 3, but with 3D houses. I was really surprised. 3D graphics of any kind should have made a huge difference, and there was even some touchscreen stuff. But I don't know. I just didn't like it. It felt like the paint-by-numbers equivalent of a Pokemon game. Over the years, I heard a lot of great things about Gen 4. Plenty of people have said that it was the last time Pokemon was truly great, or at least close to the last time. I thought maybe I just didn't play Gen 4 at the right stage in my life. I mean, I was a newly minted adult with a job and college and friends, and I didn't have as much time for games. Once my life had settled down a bit, I really liked Gen 5. So I was willing to consider that maybe Diamond and Pearl were better than I first thought. Especially because one of my biggest problems with Sword and Shield was the lack of any real interesting level design. A cool overworld with lots of caves and power plants and that kind of dungeony stuff? Nope. Not at all! Sword and Shield was really just one big string of simple linear pathways leading from town to town, with the wild area trying its hardest to pick up the slack but not quite succeeding. So after that monumental disappointment, and after hearing so many people praise Diamond and Pearl, I was genuinely excited to try out a remake. I really tried to go in with an open mind. But unfortunately, I didn't have to play the game for long before the very same been there, done that feeling started to set in. You start in a little town with four buildings. You live in the lower right one with your mom. You have a rival, and this time his thing is that he's got ADHD, I guess? There's an old professor guy who wants to fill up your Pokedex. There's a bad guy team, and they want to use a legendary Pokemon to destroy everything and recreate it in their own image. Again, but with a different 
legendary Pokemon this time? I know what you're probably thinking. And no, I don't believe it's necessarily a bad thing to have recurring tropes and themes in your games. Heck, Zelda is the ultimate champion there, but you've got to do something original with each iteration. There's got to be something to set it apart. It can't just feel like a fill in the blank. And to me, that's what Diamond and Pearl is. It's just the same thing again, and that's it. Gosh, I talked a lot of trash about Sword and Shield's story, but I have to give it at least a little credit for having some sense of character. The rival is the little brother of the previous champion, so he has more motivation than most to be the best. The bad guy is a secret bad guy. It's not a very good secret, and his motivations make very little sense. But look, at least an attempt to be different. And the bad guy team is actually a team of groupies that are in love with one of the gym leaders? It's something. But Diamond and Pearl has none of that. It's got a few characters that check up on you every once in a while, but encounters with them are so infrequent and brief that none of them make a lasting impression. The gym leaders try to be interesting and make you find them and stuff, but you just roll in, do whatever they want, blast them to smithereens and skadoodle out of there in a flash. The bad guys are just mindless drones, and I get that that's kind of the point, but the shtick gets old really fast. And their boss, the main villain, He's just called Boss. Like, he doesn't even have a name. He's just Boss. What is this, Paper Mario? Is Boss its own separate race of humanoid creatures or something? And I'll talk more about how the visual style impacts the game's locations later, but for now, I'll say that the world itself is also greatly lacking in charm. All the towns and roads blend together. They just don't have much to set them apart besides a few decent exceptions. Oh, and the wild Pokemon encounters. How many Pokemon were there by Gen 4? Like 500 or something? So why am I still seeing the same handful of Pokemon in nearly every single patch of grass? Why is it still 90% Geodudes and Zubats whenever I go in a cave? Why is it so hard to find something I want to raise when there are so many potential options? Speaking of which, remember how Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee revamped the encounter system so you could actually see Pokemon walking around? And then Sword and Shield gave us the perfect mix of the new system and classic random encounters? <laughs> None of that here. We've gone all the way back to the original system. Oh, and not only that, but when you're running, there's no minimum number of steps required to get into an encounter. So you can literally take one step into the grass, get into a fight, run away, take another step, get into another fight, run away, and get into another fight a few steps after that. And that might sound like a rare worst case scenario, but no, it happens quite a lot. I at least think walking makes it better, but that's annoying to have to do in its own way. And the return of random encounters means the return of me being super annoyed when traveling through grass and caves and stuff. Yes, repels do exist, but they're harder to come by earlier in the game, and they last like two seconds. If a previous remake changed the encounter system, there's no reason they couldn't have done the same here. The end result of all this, the blasé world and characters, the mega basic story, the agonizingly small selection of wild Pokemon, the frustrating return of purely random encounters, is a game that just feels like it's going through the motions. And I feel like I'm just going through the motions when I'm playing it. I'm just trying to get to the end of each section, just trying to get to the next town so I can beat the gym leader and get the badge and head to the next boring town. Jay Arlo, why don't you tell us how you really feel? Yeah, I got some angry feelings on the game. I do have to say, however, the Grand Underground is kind of cool. It's not quite enough to hinge a whole game on, but I do have to give credit where credit's due. At any time, you can pop down there, and it's a positively sprawling series of tunnels. There are tons of caves to poke around in, and here you'll actually get more of a variety of wild Pokémon. These caves utilize the new encounter system, so, like, it is in the game, it's just only down here. Well, whatever. <laughs> Gotta count my blessings, I guess. A win's a win. So that's fun, but my favorite thing about the Grand Underground is this little mining minigame. You've got to try and break gems and stuff out of the walls before the space you're digging in collapses. 
I don't end up using any of the stuff I get, but it's still fun to do. And really, I'm sure the whole Grand Underground is great for people who are really into the game. I'm a casual player, I just want to raise some cool Pokémon and play through the story. But for anyone who plays a lot more seriously and can really use all the items and extra Pokémon down there and wants to take part in the social aspect, this is a pretty cool feature. And the same goes for the post-game. No spoilers! if you would even consider the post-game of a Pokémon title a spoiler, but there's some fun stuff to do after the credits roll, and a heck of a lot more battles to take part in. I hear it's not as much as it was in Platinum, and you can't do a lot of it unless you fill out your Sinnoh decks, which is disappointing. I don't really feel like bothering with that. But again, more serious players will enjoy having a bunch of extra stuff to do. And I also must give credit here, because Sword and Shield didn't have much of a post-game to speak of paid DLC doesn't quite count, and Let's Go didn't even have the post-game content from Fire Red and Leaf Green. It's nice that there is indeed a reason to keep playing at the end of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. And while we're comparing and giving credit, I know I've complained a lot about how bland the world is, but at the very least, it is a world. It has some of those dungeony areas I missed in Sword and Shield. Navigating caves and bad guy headquarters and such is a decent time. There's secrets to find, and you're rewarded for going everywhere and talking to everyone. Even if it is bland, it's not awfully designed or anything. It is, at its core, a fine Pokémon world. If it was my first, I'm sure I would like it a whole lot more. Okay, it's time to talk about it. The primary internet angry thing with the game, the graphics. In theory, returning to a chibi art style could be seen as an artistic choice. Little sprites are charming in their own way, after all, and this does set the game apart from other modern Pokémon titles, but it is very difficult for me to see this as an artistic choice and not just a way to cut corners. And that's because the whole game feels like one giant cut corner. First off, the characters don't really look cute or fun or anything. They look bad. I'm already not a fan of the chibi style in the context of a remake. As I went on and on about in my Link's Awakening remake review, games used to use little sprites because that's all they could get away with without looking weird. That was how artists were able to create nice looking, sometimes even expressive characters using very few pixels. But a remake should enhance and modernize a game so that it feels like the original if the original were created today. If they had this tech back then, what would the game look like? I guarantee it wouldn't look like this. These characters are just ugly. They're stocky and bulgy and kind of gross. And despite sporting simple face textures stretched over the fronts of their heads that should be very easy to swap out depending on the situation, they barely ever change their expressions. I've played in 64 games where the characters emoted more than this. Sometimes you're talking to someone who's trying to be all intimidating, or trying to give you a sentimental speech, but it's hard to take them seriously when they look like a ridiculous little Funko Pop knockoff or something. But it's not just the chibi thing. It's hard to see so many people who think it's just the chibi thing that complainers like myself don't like, because it goes far, far beyond that. To bring up Link's Awakening and Let's Go Pikachu slash Eevee again, as with those two games, I hate that this is another Square for Square remake. Same as the chibi style, I just think it's wasting an opportunity to modernize these games. And using a simple grid-based format feels like more of a cost-cutting measure than an artistic choice. Oh man, creating a grass pattern that looks at least almost natural? Oh, no way! Then this wouldn't be a faithful remake! Eh. How convenient. It's just such a bummer, and it really brings the experience down. I already talked about how bland and by the numbers I thought the original game was, and bland by the numbers visuals have done nothing to give the game's locations the charm and identity I felt they lacked. Our town is the flower town. It's all about flowers. It's a beautiful, magical wonderland of flowers. Really? Because the four flower tiles copied and pasted around town in awkward patches isn't really selling me on that idea. Our city is super futuristic. It's got this incredible wonder of the world solar panel bridge that connects everything. High tech, flashy. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool, I guess. Our region is split in half by this mighty mountain from which all our legends were born. 
Oh, really? There's a mountain there? Huh, I, I, I can't see it. You know, because of the whole top-down thing, I can't look up to see the mountain. I can only go through it with my eyes pointed straight ahead. This was an opportunity to make the world look the way it's described, to make its locations pop, bring them to life, grant them a reason for being. But you don't get that in a Square for Square remake, do you? Nope. When all you've got is a stack of tiles to recreate exactly a control key, a C key, and a V key, there isn't much you can do at all. And here's the thing. Even if you're gonna go the economical route and create a bunch of assets that can be copied and pasted in all their original positions so that the original and the remake are arranged identically, ugh, fine. But you've at least got to make it look Good. I don't think Link's Awakening style is a good fit, but I can't deny that it looks nice. It's shiny, it's vibrant, it's charming, it's fun to look at. Then Pokemon Let's Go. Yeah, the style is disappointing, and it's not nearly as vibrant and fun, but it's still nice in its own way, still pleasant enough. Honestly, I thought that was the bare minimum for a Pokemon game. I thought that was rock bottom, the absolute lowest amount of effort that I would ever see put into Pokemon's graphics. To me, it was cheap, but just good enough to still be okay. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl does not look okay. Most of the time, it doesn't look broken or anything. You're not seeing a bunch of stock Unity assets. <laughs> Things aren't glitching all over the place. It works. At a glance, nothing is off. But most of the time, the visual quality ranges from passable to downright bad. Allow me to indulge in some graphical nitpickery. One of the game's biggest problems is that it's got a camera that changes angles sometimes, but it doesn't seem like it was made to account for that camera. The characters are whatever from a distance, but way up close is when you can tell how bad they look. And sometimes Professor What's-His-Name's face texture won't even load in properly. The overworld elements also tend to look much worse when viewed at different camera angles. And gosh, even the camera itself, the way it swings down sometimes when you talk to someone, it's so jarring and awkward. Some cut corners that worked on the DS don't work here. The first time I reached a forest, I couldn't figure out how to get inside. Then I realized that the two-tree indent with the little shadow texture that's the entrance to the forest. <laughs> I mean it, I legitimately couldn't tell at first. This is not how forest entrances look. This is not a Game Boy game. Here's a big one. Your character can move around in all different directions, but NPCs are stuck to the grid like in the original game. During cutscenes, they walk using the grid pattern. And this is one example of something that does indeed look atrocious. It looks terrible. That is not how you faithfully recreate a game. You don't keep the stuff that looks downright bad. Was that really worth the money you saved? Not animating NPCs to walk diagonally? And don't even get me started on the dirt and rocks, you guys. Too late, I'm started. Dirt and rocks look the way they did back in the day with that weird smooth geometric pattern forming boxes to indicate different levels because that was probably the only way to do it. That was the only way to achieve the desired effect. But seeing that effect recreated in 3D, it's dreadful. What is this? This isn't how games have to look anymore. Even worse, rock faces tend to have no geometry whatsoever and are just flat textures on planes. This looks worst with different camera angles, obviously, but even when the camera is in its normal place, the effect just still doesn't work. It doesn't look like a rocky wall. It looks like a regular wall with rocks painted on it. The first time I stepped into a cave and saw those walls with the overly sharp depth of field effect just to make it that much worse, I audibly wondered how I could be seeing what I was seeing in a first party Nintendo game. Maybe I am nitpicking. Maybe the game doesn't look that bad, but you know what? Context matters. I'm not gonna be this harsh when it comes to an indie game. Usually indie studios are literally doing their best with what they've got, but this is Pokemon. 
You don't need me to go on and on about how much money Pokemon makes, you already know. And this is not okay for a $60 game, much less one made by the stinking Pokemon company. And no, it doesn't get a pass because it was made by a different studio. It was still funded by Pokemon. Pokemon still called all the shots. They still decided to ship it as is instead of taking the time to make it look nice. It's a rush job, pure and simple. A rush job that manages to fall below my already rock bottom expectations. I thought we'd seen the worst of this series cheapness in Let's Go and Sword and Shield, but here we are, and I am actually amazed. Now again, I must give credit where credit is due. There are some elements of the game that look nice. Each type of trainer has a little animation for entering battle and one for when they lose. These are all very short, but they look great. There's a lot of personality packed into them, and they're little dollops of charm in what is otherwise a really dull, drab game. It's definitely disappointing to see that the animators were indeed capable of doing something like this and simply not allowed to do it more, though I guess I never really doubted the skill of the animators. They were rushed, just like everyone else. The result is a game where we get two seconds of fun, and then nothing but fun cow pops. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> talking about good stuff now. The battle backgrounds are pretty all right. They're not amazing, but compared to the rest of the game, <laughs> they look terrific. A couple of them are downright pretty. You spend a lot of time in battle, so that's good. And gosh, what is it with the water? Out of everything in the game, why is this the one thing that just looks amazing? Well, amazing some of the time, but not all of the time. Like, you're in the ocean and the water looks great. You're in a lake and it looks completely different. And it kind of looks like you're hovering above the water. Um, oh. Okay, uh, better than looking good none of the time, I guess. What on earth? <laughs> no, I guess that's kind of it. <laughs> I actually wanted to talk more about the positives, but those are all the standouts. Everything else is either bad or fine. Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl is a remake that comes 15 years after the game it's based on and doesn't even look that much better. In fact, one could argue that it actually looks worse. I mean, I'll take nice pixel graphics over bad 3D graphics any day of the week. Just ask Golden Sun Dark Dawn, poor thing. That's it for the graphics, but I've got a little grab bag of additional comments on the game. I really appreciate how running shoes are on by default and you don't even have to hold a button to run. I wanna run most of the time anyway, but Something about how collision works in this game is wonky. I get caught on everything, and in a grid, all the objects are kind of jammed close together, so moving around is way more annoying than it should be. It's kind of hard to tell that there's a problem when just watching. You gotta play it to really get a feel for how aggravating it is. Next, I love, love, love it when Pokemon can follow me. I'm all about the fun of pretending that these creatures are real, and it's great to see that they're actually there, and not just things I only see in battles. But man, they really get in the way in this game. <laughs> Were they like this in Let's Go? Because I don't remember them blocking me and even warping right into my path so often. Some of them also run really slowly, which is kind of cute because it's more realistic, but constantly falling behind and warping back to you, <laughs> not as much. Sort of on that note, if I like immersion, then I should like how when your Pokemon grows to love you, you start to get different little text things about it on the field. Like how happy it is, and it'll find berries for you. And sometimes in battle, it'll even land a critical hit or stop itself from fainting just because it loves you. Isn't that fun? No, it's not fun because there's a big trade-off. Pokemon battles are already absurdly slow, but when a Pokemon loves you, it constantly does little jigs in battle, like when it enters a fight and the game gives you all these little updates about how it's feeling. Not only does it waste a ton of time, but it also makes Pokemon feel a lot less cool. You catch this universe destroying legendary and the game can't stop telling you about how it's about to cry and it's thinking of your smile. The funny thing is I liked this feature in Let's Go, but I guess the novelty is worn off. I'm sick of it now. 
few more, lack of platinum content, complete and utter nonsense. It was universally deemed the superior version of the game. There is absolutely no reason not to include it. There's no scenario where it's a good idea. If they try to sell it to us as DLC, that will be awful. If they try to sell a whole third version of the game, that'll be even more awful. If they give it to us for free, we'll be happy, but lots of us will already be done with the game and we'll be like, why didn't you give us this before? And if they just don't give it to us at all, then great, we are stuck with the inferior version. It's a 15 year old game. Would it have actually cost more money to give us platinum stuff? And don't tell me it's because they wanted to make the game faithful to the original. Because there's no value in being faithful when it just makes the game worse. You want a faithful adaptation of The Shining? Watch the awful TV movie. You want a good adaptation? Watch the very different Kubrick film. It's way better even than the book, don't at me. <sighs> okay, almost done. Forced experience share. It is probably wrong to have it on all the time with no option to turn it off. But as I've said about it before, I'm kind of a fan. And if it was always optional, I probably wouldn't have used it. So I'm kind of glad it's mandatory. Each Pokemon gets the same amount of experience after a battle, regardless of how many are in the party, which essentially means that you're multiplying your gains with each additional member. This should make the game easy, and it probably still is easy for more serious players with good builds, but for a casual player like me, it's decently balanced. It seems like it's all been designed in such a way that if I have a full team and keep my openers in rotation, fighting every trainer puts me just about at the levels of a lot of my opponents. If I ever start pulling ahead, then I just skip a batch of trainers. Battles are way more fun when they're challenging, so as with Let's Go, I've really enjoyed a decent number of these battles. I was actually slightly underleveled when I fought the Elite Four, so I had to retry some of the battles quite a lot and had a fun time. Thanks, experience share. There's only one more thing to talk about, and there's a good chance this will be the most controversial of all. Yes, even among those who agree with me about everything else. There is some good music in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Some really standout tracks that frequently come up in VGM compilations that I enjoy. But there is also a lot of music that I don't enjoy. I would even go as far as to say I dislike it. Usually when music doesn't do it for me in a game, I'm just like, whatever. It sounds fine, I'm just neutral. It's actually quite rare for me to be playing a game and stop and listen and be like, man, that sounds kinda bad. I remember feeling this way when I first played the game, and I was trying to not even consider that when I went into the remake. I tried to go in with fresh ears, but the same thing happened. So much of the music is just so... random? Like, the melodies just jump all over the place, like they were written by an algorithm or something, and they don't have any sort of structure and don't resolve in pleasing ways. It just kinda sounds... gross. I know Pokemon music is pretty much across the board loved by all, so I don't know what's up. I have a friend with really similar musical tastes, and one day I was listening to some Pokemon music, and they didn't know what it was, and it might have even been some Diamond and Pearl music, and they were like, this is kind of bad. And I was like, I know, right? <laughs> it must just be some kind of weird specific taste thing or something, I don't know. In case it wasn't already obvious, I do not like Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Of course, as with all my reviews, I must remind you that I have no problem with people enjoying it. It's a Pokemon game, and as I talked about in my Sword and Shield review, that means a certain baseline amount of fun. If you're way into the series and you love that core formula, and you love building up teams and fighting at least semi-competitively and all that, I'm sure this game is great. And if you've got nostalgic attachments to the original, then you'll probably enjoy the remake quite a lot. There is nothing wrong with liking it. If you look at it in a vacuum, maybe it's even a straight up good game. But I'm not looking at it in a vacuum. Like I said, context really matters. To me, it's a disappointing remake of a game that was already very bland. 
and I'm not going to give it credit for being at least as fun as any other Pokemon game, because how far can that excuse go? How far can they push this cheapness? How many corners can they cut? How far down can they trim the production process before even that core formula stops being enough? Because it feels like there's no end to this. I thought we had already reached the bottom, but Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are down at a whole new level. We're in this deep, I'ma just say it. I would be embarrassed to publish this game. The joke would be on me because it's selling like crazy, but on a personal level, I wouldn't be able to do it. Such a rushed, ugly experience coming from the creators of the highest grossing media franchise in human history. It's gross. It is simply gross. The line between art and product is sometimes hard to see, but not in this case. This is a cold, calculated, shareholder-pleasing product made exclusively for the 2021 holiday rush. As long as there's a Pokemon game under the tree, all is right with the world, huh? Well, that's it for my review of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. But what are your thoughts? Let me know down in the comments, even though there's no way I'm gonna read the comments. <laughs> See you later.